Chapter 30 of Moral Letters, Volume 1 by Seneca, translated by Gummier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 30. On Conquering the Conqueror. I have beheld Ophidius Bassus, that noble man, shattered in health and wrestling with his years. But they already bear upon him so heavily that he cannot be raised up. Old age has settled down upon him with great, yes, with its entire weight. You know that his body was always delicate and sapless. For a long time he has kept it in hand, or, to speak more correctly, has kept it together. Of a sudden, it has collapsed. Just as in a ship that springs a leak, you can always stop the first or the second fissure, but when many holes begin to open and let in water, the gaping hole cannot be saved. Similarly, in an old man's body, there is a certain limit up to which you can sustain and prop its weakness. But when it comes to resemble a decrepit building, when every joint begins to spread, and while one is being repaired another falls apart, then it is time for a man to look about him and consider how he may get out. But the mind of our friend Bassus is active. Philosophy bestows this boon upon us. It makes us joyful in the very sight of death, strong and brave no matter in what state the body may be, cheerful and never failing, though the body fail us. A great pilot can sail even when his canvas is rent. If his ship be dismantled, he can yet put in trim what remains of her hull and hold her to her course. This is what our friend Bassus is doing, and he contemplates his own end with the courage and countenance which you would regard as undue indifference in a man who so contemplated another's. This is a great accomplishment, Lucilius, and one which needs long practice to learn, to depart calmly when the inevitable hour arrives. Other kinds of death contain an ingredient of hope. A disease comes to an end. A fire is quenched. Falling houses have set down in safety those whom they seemed certain to crush. The sea has cast ashore unharmed those whom it had engulfed by the same force through which it drew them down. The soldier has drawn back his sword from the very neck of his doomed foe but those whom old age is leading away to death have nothing to hope for old age alone grants no reprieve no ending to be sure is more painless but there is none more lingering our friend bassus seemed to me to be attending his own funeral and laying out his own body for burial and living almost as if he had survived his own death and bearing with wise resignation his grief at his own departure. For he talks freely about death, trying hard to persuade us that if this process contains any element of discomfort or of fear, it is the fault of the dying person, and not of death itself. Also, that there is no more inconvenience at the actual moment than there is after it is over, and it is just as insane, he adds, for a man to fear what will not happen to him as to fear what he will not feel if it does happen. Or does anyone imagine it to be possible that the agency by which feeling is removed can be itself felt? Therefore, says Bassus, death stands so far beyond all evil that it is beyond all fear of evils. I know that all this has often been said, and should be often repeated, but neither when I read them were such precepts so effective with me, nor when I heard them from the lips of those who were at a safe distance from the fear of the things which they declared were not to be feared. But this old man had the greatest weight with me when he discussed death, and death was near. For I must tell you what I myself think. I hold that one is braver at the very moment of death than when one is approaching death. For death, 
when it stands near us, gives even to inexperienced men the courage not to seek to avoid the inevitable. So the gladiator, who throughout the fight has been no matter how faint-hearted, offers his throat to his opponent and directs the wavering blade to the vital spot. Footnote. The defeated gladiator is supposed to be on his back, his opponent standing over him and about to deliver the final blow. As the blade wavers at the throat, searching for the jugular vein, the victim directs the point. End footnote. But an end that is near at hand, and is bound to come, calls for tenacious courage of soul. This is a rarer thing, and none but the wise man can manifest it. Accordingly, I listened to Bassus with the deepest pleasure. He was casting his vote concerning death, and pointing out what sort of a thing it is when it is observed, so to speak, nearer at hand. I suppose that a man would have your confidence in a larger degree, and would have more weight with you, if he had come back to life, and should declare from experience that there is no evil in death. And so, regarding the approach of death, those will tell you best what disquiet it brings, who have stood in its path, who have seen it coming and have welcomed it. Bassus may be included among these men, and he had no wish to deceive us. He says that it is as foolish to fear death as to fear old age, for death follows old age precisely as old age follows youth. He who does not wish to die cannot have wished to live. For life is granted to us with the reservation that we shall die. To this end our path leads. Therefore, how foolish is it to fear it, since men simply await that which is sure, but fear only that which is uncertain. Death has its fixed rule, equitable and unavoidable. Who can complain when he is governed by terms which include everyone? The chief part of equity, however, is equality. But it is superfluous at the present time to plead nature's cause, for she wishes our laws to be identical with her own. She but resolves that which she has compounded, and compounds again that which she has resolved. Moreover, if it falls to the lot of any man to be set gently adrift by old age, not suddenly torn from life, but withdrawn bit by bit oh verily he should thank the gods one and all because after he has had his fill he is removed to a rest which is ordained for mankind a rest that is welcome to the weary you may observe certain men who crave death even more earnestly than others are wont to beg for life and i do not know which men give us greater courage those who call for death or those who meet it cheerfully and tranquilly for the first attitude is sometimes inspired by madness and sudden anger the second is the calm which results from fixed judgment before now men have gone to meet death in a fit of rage but when death comes to meet him no one welcomes it cheerfully except the man who has long since composed himself for death I admit, therefore, that I have visited this dear friend of mine more frequently on many pretexts, but with the purpose of learning whether I should find him always the same, and whether his mental strength was perhaps waning in company with his bodily powers. But it was on the increase, just as the joy of the charioteer is wont to show itself more clearly when he is on the seventh round. Footnote i.e. when on the home stretch, of the course, and nears the prize. Indeed, he often said, in accord with the counsels of Epicurus, quote, I hope, first of all, that there is no pain at the moment when a man breathes his last, but if there is, one will find an element of comfort in its very shortness, for no great pain lasts long and at all events a man will find relief at the very time when soul and body are being torn asunder even though the process be accompanied by excruciating pain 
in the thought that after this pain is over he can feel no more pain i am sure however that an old man's soul is on his very lips and that only a little force is necessary to disengage it from the body a fire which has seized upon a substance that sustains it needs water to quench it or sometimes the destruction of the building itself but the fire which lacks sustaining fuel dies away of its own accord End quote. i am glad to hear such words my dear lucilius not as new to me but as leading me into the presence of an actual fact and what then have i not seen many men break the thread of life i have indeed seen such men but those have more weight with me who approach death without any loathing for life letting death in so to speak and not pulling it towards them bassus kept saying it is due to our own fault that we feel this torture because we shrink from dying only when we believe that our end is near at hand but who is not near death it is ready for us in all places and at all times let us consider he went on to say when some agency of death seems imminent how much nearer are other varieties of dying which are not feared by us a man is threatened with death by an enemy but this form of death is anticipated by an attack of indigestion and if we are willing to examine critically the various causes of our fear we shall find that some exist and others only seem to be we do not fear death we fear the thought of death for death itself is always the same distance from us wherefore if it is to be feared at all it is to be feared always for what season of our life is exempt from death but what i really ought to fear is that you will hate this long letter worse than death itself so i shall stop do you however always think on death in order that you may never fear it farewell end of chapter thirty